Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so excited to be getting this workshop started. We are very excited. I have with me an esteem, esteemed guest. I can't even hardly get my words out. I'm so excited about this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> but as you all are coming into the conference here, um, I am super excited. Again, my name is Lolita Harlem. I am the uh, CEO of My Natural Me, which is a nonprofit organization. And as you uh, see in the chat, it is all about basically empowering women and girls, giving resources, platforms, so that you can have what you need to succeed. So that is the very quick, short version. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do when it comes to empowerment, um, some things that are really needed for that are financial uh, stability, um, home ownership. All those things are very, very important when it comes to just empowerment, independence, all of that. And this month, June, that we are recording this happens to be Home Ownership Awareness Month. So what better time to bring um, attention to home ownership? But not just home ownership. We're going to talk about just kind of all the things that are connected to that. So as you come in the room, we are about to get the party started. And to do that, I am going to start by <clears throat> introducing our featured guest speaker, which I'm super honored and excited to have Miss Stacy Tucker joining us. And I'm guys, I'm doing technical, I'm doing everything. So let me let me spotlight. Let me spotlight for everyone. Oh, I'd have to remove the pins. Okay. We're gonna we just gonna do it like this. <laughs> but I am excited to have Stacy Tucker joining us. So a little bit about Stacy. I'm sure if you already know the things that Stacy's done in the community and doing in the community. She is truly a legacy builder. She is all about making sure you get your coins and get your coins right and get your coins protected. So we are very honored to have Stacy joining us as our featured guest. A little more about Stacy. Um, and I wanna make sure that I get this completely right. So Stacy also is an award-winning um, State Farm insurance agent. She also is the um, part of the chairman's circle. So Stacy, I know when you do your uh, intro, you will also share a little bit more about that. But again, just we are honored to have Stacy here. So Stacy, I'm gonna have you Start the program and just let everyone know a little bit about yourself, about your background. Let's let's get into it. Absolutely. Uh, as always, Lita, it's an honor and a pleasure to be on your program and to be able to share with with women and some men, because y'all know I'm passionate about helping women, women business owners and women just understand their finances in a way that allows them to leave a legacy. So I educate families and business on how to build how to properly fund and how to successfully transfer a legacy. I primarily do that through insurance plans, though there are other ways that we'll talk about on the call to get that. Before I was uh, educating people on, on legacy and insurance planning, I was a realtor, like many of you ladies on the call today. I did that, I got my license in 2005 and I was active in the industry for about 15 years. I also have a mortgage license, like some of you also on the call. And so you can see how intertwined all those things are and how important they are to the home buying process. So I hope tonight y'all will get something out of this and be able to see how it all fits together and it takes some of the mystery out of the home buying process. So a lot of people think of insurance um, as a necessary evil, that kind of thing you need to have only if something bad happens. I, I agree with that assessment, right? Um, that being said, we do have to use it in a way that optimizes, as Lisa, the coins we spend on it and the coins that it allows us to keep in our hands, our children's hands and our grandchildren's hands. That's the legacy part, folks. So write that down. Right. So I like to make sure we're going to, you know, share how you can do that. And since this is a home buying seminar, we're going to focus on that piece of it and to make sure you understand how important it is to the home buying process. But from that, we'll filter down into how it helps all of us protect our legacy in every which way. So let's get into it. So if you're buying a home, unless Lee, did you have a specific question you wanted me to address? But No, I would love for you, just like you're doing, get started. And then, you know, as people, as you're going, uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat, all that good stuff. 
Absolutely. So if you're buying a home, if you've ever bought a home, it, you know, it's a rigorous process. I think we have a mortgage lender on the call as well. Uh, the mortgage process is one of the pieces that is the most mysterious to most people about buying a home. On HGTV, they show people buying homes. They don't show them getting the mortgage, right? So that part still remains a mystery for most of us. And so as part of that, if you are using a lender and you're buying one of the houses in Northern Virginia where the median home prices are upwards, depending on which zone and region, you're in 500,000, sometimes six or 700,000, that lender is gonna require that you have homeowner's insurance. What does it protect? What does it really do? It protects your property. That, that asset that you just obtained now is subject to, to risk like fire or burst pipes or wind or hail or snow or things like that. If there's damage to that home, there's a good chance that you don't have the savings in your account, or even if you do, that you want to spend that to fix the repairs on that home. So your insurance plan will cover that for you, minus your deductible. This week, I literally video toured a home yesterday of a client in Vienna whose house had caught on fire. He can't live in it. It's fully smoke damaged and water damaged from the firemen. So not only can he not live in the house, a lot of his contents are damaged. Who's going to pay for all that? He's staying in a hotel. He's got to eat outside his home. He may have to board his pet. Your homeowner's insurance covers all of those things for you. So you're thinking, well, what does that have to do with my legacy? The estimates coming in at right now on early on the reconstruction costs on the home is $300,000. So if you don't want to pay that out of your own pocket, insurance is what covers a large a large part of those expenses. So if you don't have the right thing in place, that's $300,000 that you don't get to pass on to your uh, children, your grandchildren, in terms of assets and things like that. I'm going to circle back a little bit. If I think about, if you think about the word legacy, um, and you guys can put it in the chat, like what's your definition of that? What does that mean, really? What is legacy? What is generational wealth? What it means is not just letting your work live for the moment that you're in, but it can be passed on to future generations. And so many people think of it like, oh, it's what somebody left me in a will or in a trust or things like that, or, or a body of work as Lee and I were just talking about. Let's say you're an artist or you are a musician and you have a body of work that you get to sell or leave behind. Think about people like Prince and Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston. Their work is something that could be left as a legacy and sold for years and years and generations and generations, you know, in the form of royalties or things like that. So how do we protect those things? It's through the insurance. And if, in this workshop, specifically on the home buyer side, you do need to obtain that um, insurance before you go to closing. The lender is not going to even approve the loan until you obtain insurance prior to. So what you would do is once you've driven around with the realtor, we've got Sydney on the line, we've got Jennifer, right? You've driven around, you've shown them 60 houses. They finally find the house of their dreams, right? And they uh, want to make an offer and they get one in, it's accepted and they send the file to the lender. The lender says, great, we need to know how much the insurance is going to be because that's how we'd be able to determine how much we're going to add to your mortgage payment each month because that that insurance is going to go into your monthly mortgage payment. Um, I, I'll let Jennifer and, and, and Sydney talk about that later, but like um, your mortgage consists of four things, P-I-T-I, -I, and I'm the last I, the principal interest taxes and insurance. Like I said, it used to be insurance was considered kind of like this ancillary thing about the home buying process, kind of like this necessary evil. Today, folks, people are unable to buy homes sometimes because of the cost of the insurance. It's gotten so expensive in certain areas and for reasons that I'm going to talk to you about in a few minutes. So it is a critical part of being able to own a home, first of all, and then a critical part of being able to protect that asset that you just acquired so that you can uh, stay in the home and that the money stays in your pocket, not in the hands of a contractor or someone else. Let the insurance company take care of that. So back to what I said a few minutes ago about how it used to be a, a, a sort of a, an afterthought in the insurance, in the home buying process. Because the amount of the insurance goes into your monthly mortgage payment, it's counted as part of the cost. And there are some ratios that you have to have in your monthly payment to be able to qualify. So let's say, I'm going to use easy math. Let's say the annual premium for your homeowner's insurance is $2,400, right? 
that's $200 a month. So that adds to the cost of owning the home. Each month it has to be paid along with your taxes and HOA and things like that. Now, if you um, choose coverages, some of them you don't get to pick. Some of them the lender requires it, like the amount of replacement cost, but things like your deductibles, uh, your liability limits, things like that. You can control costs by um, modifying some things. And so in my office, we're going to educate you on how to make sure those costs can stay in line with what the lender requires so that you can obtain the home. I'll give you a more dramatic example. I think one that people are hearing about a lot in the news. So for example, in Florida with flood insurance and the insurance prices are so expensive that people can't sell their homes now because people can't afford to buy them. The insurance may be six or seven or $12,000 a year just for the home insurance. And sometimes it's not a big home. It's a condo or something or a small home. That being said, it makes it unaffordable. So in our area, we're trying to make sure that we can continue to provide affordable homeowners insurance so that people can afford homes, in, even though the prices keep elevating. One way we do that in our office is, like I said earlier, is by educating people on how to optimize the cost and make sure they only have the coverages that are absolutely necessary and by maybe raising deductibles. Um, and that way you can fit the lender's criteria and guidelines as well. So that was, you know, a lot on homeowners insurance. If you're not looking to buy right now, maybe fairly uninteresting, but you'll understand what I mean, right, Jennifer, when you're trying to get to closing and you need your, uh, <laughs> you need the homeowners insurance to be at yes. a certain price to still qualify. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to talk about briefly now is, um, before we uh, go on to some of the other parts, is that, um, so when I, when you think of assets, we we know a home is one, right? I think if I said name an asset, most people would say, oh, home, right, cars your boats, like your cash, your money in your bank accounts, your CDs, all those things are assets. Um, a, a piece that people often neglect to uh, neglect is protecting it, like your paycheck. Your paycheck is actually your largest asset. Your unearned income is your largest asset in most cases. And I'll repeat that. Your unearned income is your largest asset. And in this area to even live, uh, we were looking at the numbers today on what it would take to even buy a $450,000 home in this area. You need to earn about $120,000, you know, with, you know, a six and a half percent interest rate, 10% down, all those things. So if you make 120 a year in 10 years, that's $1.2 million. And that's often more than the value of the house you live in. So it's your unearned income. So if you don't protect that paycheck, you don't get to leave it to your children or your grandchildren. And that's the piece where legacy comes in. And one of the single most important and easiest ways to do that um, that that's obtainable for most people is through life insurance. I know y'all knew that was coming, right? And it's something often overlooked because it in itself is an asset. It just replaces the income that you would be earning if God forbid you walked off, walked off the planet or even better, if you stayed alive. There are forms of it that allows you to use it while you're living to protect those assets, to even obtain a home. Um, an allowable way to get a down payment for a home on your asset side is the cash value in your life insurance policies. It doesn't have to be seasoned. Um, of course, you may have to document it to the lender, but it's funds that you've already had and you don't have to borrow from a bank. You don't need to run a credit check or anything to get those funds. You don't need a gift letter from a parent. That's great if you can get it. Some of us can't. So if you have those things from an early age or whenever you do it, it gives you the opportunity to use that as an asset, not something necessarily dramatic about dying, but about living and being able to obtain a home. And I know the ladies later are going to talk about, you know, ways to get down payments and how much you need for FHA loans, VA, conventional and all those things. But, but as a as a group, you have to start thinking about your coins and your assets in ways that make a lot of sense in terms of earning more on them. If you have a dollar in the bank and it's earning zero or they're charging you five dollars a month to, to just to hold it there, you're losing money, you know, but if you're earning higher interest rates on it, like 4%, 5%, 6% through th so different uh, plans, whether that's, you know, annuities, my friend on the, is on the phone. She's a banker, an expert in annuities, CDs. They don't have to be complex things, but just things that help us take our coins and make them work for us, right? Like our friend, like make your coins work as hard as you do. And so those are some of the things that I do as an agent. Um, and in my agency, it's really helped people understand how to protect their assets 
whether it's the physical assets, but even your 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 paycheck assets, things that you're going to earn in the future. If it weren't important to you, we would just stay home. You wouldn't spend an hour commuting every day and working under somebody and going to meetings that could be an email if your paycheck wasn't important. And if we're not protecting it, then it, we're not doing the things that we we claim that we want to do for our families, our children, and our grandchildren. So for those of you who have questions about this, there'll be tons of other opportunities throughout the call to talk about the importance of insurance in all its aspects, You know, whether it's medical insurance, auto insurance, tons of questions about that kind of thing, but because it's a home buying seminar, I want to share how it's important to you in the home buying process and how it can help you win. You know, in the right, you need the right team to get a home. It's not just one professional. It's not just your realtor, your lender, your mortgage person, your title person, your attorney, your insurance person. They're a partner in you winning when it's time to buy a home in a very competitive market. So think of me as that. Your, 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 your friend, your partner in the home buying process, and I'm available to help anybody with any questions or obtaining and moving in that direction. And Stacy, you know, I, first of all, that was awesome information. Um, as before we kind of move through this, this workshop, right? I want, as I mentioned, this is sponsored by My Natural Me, which is all about empowering women and girls. And what I know about you, Stacey, and I really feel like it, it really needs to be said, um, and your information, of course, will be linked for those watching it currently or after the fact, as women, right? Because I think it needs to be stated, you know, Stacey goes out and, and speaks nationally, internationally, top dollar, but Stacey, you choose to do programs like this to volunteer because I know you are passionate about women having what they need to be empowered. Why is this type of information, why is this topic, um, um, insurance, home ownership, why is that so important for us to discuss when we talk about women being empowered? It's pretty easy. I think if any of us are on any social media platforms or any of us, now that we're post-pandemic and a post-COVID post posture, we all got a chance to see what we really care about. You know, most of us don't love commuting. Most of us didn't love being away from our families and our pets and all those things in our homes all that time. And now that we have an opportunity, like many of us here, either at home, what I found out is that people are, I don't want to use the word confused, but really uneducated about it. Um, for those of you who know me well, if you start getting me talking about school curriculum and college degrees and what we learn in school, as opposed to experiences, it's kind of abysmal what our education system does when it comes to teaching people about money, women in particular, because it's been taboo. Why, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it at the dinner table. If you talk about like, why you want to talk about dying? Why you want to talk about saving money? All you want to do is talk about money all the time. Why are you you're so ambitious? Those sorts of things. And I talk to women daily of all ages, of all backgrounds, of all nationalities, and when I say women in their 40s and 50s are sometimes the ones I'm most dismayed by because a lot of times they're going through a life change. Sometimes, you know, the children are coming out of school or college and they're going through like a separation or divorce. They don't know anything about their money. And so I'd rather see a woman, all people, but women particularly to, uh, to be educated about money and how it works so that they can stay empowered and do great things for other women you know, and be happy and, and live a life that they've dreamed of, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean having egads of money. It just means using that money to do the things they wanted to do, spend time with their grandkids or with their dog or go to the beach or be in a ministry or whatever that work may mean for you. You need to have a certain amount of assets to be able to do that easily. I love it. Any questions? So I know later on in the program, we're going to have the full panel up so that questions can be asked. Um, Let's see. Okay, so there is a question. It says, if I purchase a home, how much life insurance should I purchase? That's a really good question. And I'll keep that one short. So most of us are signing up for 30-year mortgages, right? So your mortgage, let's say if you buy a $600,000 house and you put 10% down, you're financing $540,000, right? If one of the breadwinners or one of the people who were, was required to qualify for that doesn't have income anymore, now that doesn't mean necessarily they passed away, but maybe they get hurt or disabled and can't work, you, you should have life insurance enough, equal enough to at least pay some of the mortgage off or at least to make the mortgage payment for a couple of years so that it eases the stress of the surviving partner or the one who's working to keep the home. 
but it's easy to get five hundred thousand dollars in life insurance. It may not be the form you want. It may be term, but it's a good strategy. And a lot of that will depend on your current life circumstances. If you have children, young children, older children, if you're in your retirement years, all those things will make a difference on what you should get. You need to consult a professional either way to determine what the right number is for you. Good question, Robert. I love it. I love it. All right. So definitely feel free as you're thinking of different questions, put them in the chat. So as we talk about home buying, how many, and you this is a safe space. You can raise, you can raise your virtual hand. <laughs> um, how many of you may have thought about home buying, but you didn't think that you were in position financially to be able to buy a house? Mm -hmm. I'm raising my, my, <laughs> <laughs> yep. I see some hands. Yep. I see some hands, right? So what I'm excited about this next presenter that is going to be, yeah, the hands are going up. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, you got your your you got your work cut out for you. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to bring to the front Kelly, who is going to help us understand that it is possible. There are programs out there with the with our lenders that can help us when it comes to purchasing a home. So, Kelly, I'm going to go ahead and spotlight you, bring okay. you to the front. Awesome. Thank All you right. so much and for course, you provide your background. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Well, my name is Kelly Williams. I am a branch sales manager with Geneva Financial. And um, I was just going to dive right in, but I did want to mention, and I'm actually going to speak on something that happened today <laughs> um, to piggyback on Stacy. Um, I'm actually a life insurance agent as well. <laughs> I have been for 20 years. I, I agree with every single thing Stacy said. And um, I'm just going to kind of dive right in um, with the, the question I get most often, right? I'll just start there. And the question I get most often is, should I buy a house with interest rates being where they are? That's the number one question, okay? Um, and I would, I would say a resounding yes. Um, and the reason, there's several reasons. Um, number one reason is um, interest rates go up and down. And we don't know where rates are going to be next year, right? So locking in wherever the rate is now will ensure that you have a fixed payment. Most, most uh, buyers are in a fixed payment right now. There are still adjustable mortgages out there. Um, you do have to, it's a pretty strict criteria now to qualify for one, but um, for the most part, you're gonna have a fixed rate. So you're gonna lock in whatever the rate is. So you're gonna protect yourself in case the rates continue to go up. Okay, so that's, that's one. Um, and remember too, you have the option to refinance that mortgage payment. OK, if the rates go down, we hope they do. And, you know, so you're protected against that. You're not stuck in that payment for 30 years. You're just going to lock in the payment uh, for you if you want to stay in that payment for 30 years. OK, you're going to have a fixed rate initially with the option to refi if the rates go down. So you're protected. You're protecting yourself in that instance. And also rent is is subject to inflation. OK, and it has increased significantly. Um, owning a home uh, is going to protect you from the rising cost of rent. OK, rent has actually jumped 30 percent nationwide uh, between 2019 and 2023, whereas home values have increased 26 percent over the past five years and 49 percent over the past 10 years in this area. OK, so if you bought a house, if you bought a house 10 years ago for three hundred thousand dollars, you actually are going to you're having a value of about five hundred thousand now in that home. So you have about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in equity. What can you do? What does that even mean? Right. What can I do with that? Well, with equity, you can renovate your home. You know, how would you use it? You can renovate that home. You can pay off medical bills, a vacation, start a business, buy another property, build more equity. <laughs> you know, your home can do quite a bit. The list is endless. So yes, I, I say, you know, if it's on your mind, buy the home if you can qualify for it. Um, one other neat thing with buying a home, as we get older, 
some of us haven't saved for retirement. You'll find seniors, 60s, 70s, 80s even, who don't have a lot of money saved. Well, guess what? If they have a home that's paid off and they've built equity up over the past 30 years, that home will now be their retirement. The home will pay them in a reverse mortgage if they choose to take one out. The reverse mortgage is where the bank is paying you. It's, it's just the best thing you can possibly do. <laughs> I mean, it's nice in case you don't have those savings that we hope you do in your older years. Um, so that's another piece to it. It's just an awesome thing to do for yourself, generational wealth. I wanted to talk to you, Stacy, <laughs> Today, um, I actually had someone apply for a mortgage loan and the credit was, it was only a 583. I'm going to call her Ashley. Okay. Um, Ashley had a 583 credit score. She had, she put on the application that she had a $300,000 life insurance plan. So I'm, I'm excited now, right? I'm, I'm giddy. I'm like, okay, I think I can help her even with this 583 <laughs> credit score. Um, well, when I called her, had the conversation, she had a $300,000 term life insurance. Okay. So with that said, if you have a low credit score and, you know, 580, in order to qualify for, let's say, an FHA plan, you're going to need adequate what's called reserves or assets. A cash value life insurance plan would have gotten her approved. She had $300,000 on there. If you have a $300,000 retirement plan or assets, you can get approved for a, um, she was applying for a $400,000 loan. She made a very good income. So she would have gotten approved. Unfortunately, we're going to, we have some work to do now, but um, you know, I just wanted to kind of add that in there. And then as far as the loan programs, okay. Loan programs, conventional, most probably the most uh, common one you've probably heard of a conventional loan. FHA loan is a government backed loan. And then of course we have VA loans. We have uh, USDA loans with a conventional loan. You do want to have a pretty good credit score. You want to be, I would say, over 700 to qualify for the best rates. Um, it's a harder loan to qualify for because they do want to see reserves. They do want to see, you know, savings. And they do want you to have at least a credit score of 620, okay, in order to qualify for that loan. Um, 3% down is, is, is the program that they offer for first-time home buyers if you qualify for that. Um, usually you're going to want to put down anywhere between five and 20%. Um, Stacy mentioned earlier, principal interest taxes and insurance are included in your mortgage payment. So part of that is, um, your mortgage insurance. Okay. Unless you're paying 20% down on a conventional loan, you're going to have what's called PMI private mortgage insurance. That's going to be included in that payment. Okay. Now, if you're putting down 20%, then that eliminates that. You won't have that on a conventional loan. Okay. So with the, with the um, FHA loan, you just need a 580 credit score, but you will have to have sizable assets. So I say if you're right around 620, you got a better shot at getting approved for an FHA loan. You'll need three and a half percent down. Okay. And also you're going to need closing cost money. Closing costs, you're going to need to save anywhere between three and five percent. Okay, I would say in this in this market, save on the higher end, five percent, because the taxes, the insurance, things are high now. So I would say have five percent. I tell everybody eight and ten percent of the purchase price is typically what you want to have in savings. Um, you know, for conventional or FHA loan, either one. Now there are other loans. There's the VA program if you've ever served in the military. Um, active duty, retirees, um, the VA loan is a wonderful loan because there's no down payment. Do still have to have closing cost money? Um, you know, now your realtor, maybe your realtor can negotiate some closing cost help for you with any of the loan programs. Okay. But as a general rule, if you, you know, if that's not an option, then you're going to want to have that in savings somewhere. You can have that in checking, savings, IRAs, retirement accounts, life insurance, as long as it's cash value. Okay. Um, you know, so as long as you have those monies saved somewhere where we can document, speaking of documentation, you cannot have money under your pillow. Okay. That's not going to cut it. You have to take that money that's under your pillow or in your safe and put it in a bank account for at least 60 days. Cause we have to document that money that you have, that you've saved. Okay. And this is because of 
um, fraud, uh, money laundering, things like that that took place 10 years ago, I'm sorry, 2008, whenever it was, when we had that market crash, the laws are a lot stricter now. The rules are, are tighter. So they want to make sure that there's a paper trail for every dollar. Okay, so you want to make sure that you're doing that. Also, securing your loan, you want to make sure that you have all of your documents, because when you apply for a mortgage loan, we're going to do a credit check. Okay, we're going to make sure that your credit is at least good enough to qualify the loan program, but we're going to look at some things. We're going to look at your liabilities. Okay, so your liabilities are those things, those debts you owe on credit. That's part of your debt to income. You've probably uh, heard of the debt to income metric that lenders use to qualify you. Well, that is your monthly expenses that's on credit versus your gross monthly income. It's got to be under 50% to qualify for a conventional loan and under 56% to qualify for an FHA loan. Okay, I know I'm going fast. I'm trying not to, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm sure this is recorded. You guys will see this and you can ask me any question that you want. But these are things that we're going to look for and we're going to, and, and so once I've done that, I'm gonna ask you for your documents because I have to prove what you've told me. So I have to see your pay stubs. I have to see your W-2s. If you're self-employed, I have to see your tax returns at least three years. Okay, I've got to see your bank statements at least two months. That money that you took from under your pillow, I want to see that in your bank account, okay? I've got to see 60 days worth of statement, okay? Um, and then from there, you know, hopefully I can approve you. And then we're happy. I'm going to issue a pre-approval letter for you. Yay! All right. Then I'm going to email you. I'm going to email your, your, excuse me, your realtor, okay? Your realtor is going to use that pre-approval letter to submit an offer on your behalf on that home that you can't wait to move into, that you're so excited about. That pre-approval letter is gold, okay? So you want that, all right? Now, as far as programs for first-time home buyers, well, there's plenty of them. <laughs> um, I am in Maryland, but I cover DMV. I cover the whole DMV in North Carolina. So most of my clients are in Maryland, so I utilize the Maryland Mortgage Program pretty often. It's a state-based program that pays up to five, actually 6%. It pays up to 6% if you qualify with income, um, but there are all the other programs, um, the Chinoa Fund, and there's one called the Arrive Program, which covers 5%. That's available in any state. So if you're in Virginia or DC, um, those programs will pay up to 5%. They are repayable seconds, okay, that you have to pay back in 10 years. Okay, so that's included in your mortgage payment, but it's a way for us to get you into the house. It can be refinanced as well. Okay, so we can get you we can get you into the house with those DPA programs or down payment assistance programs, and then later down the road we can refinance you right out of it into a fixed payment if you want to do that. Okay, and then um, that leads me to my favorite program. Um, I am a lender affiliate with Homes for Heroes. Um, this is an organization um, that's pretty near and dear to me. It's a rewards program for our community heroes, those who uh, have been on the front lines for us, law enforcement, military, healthcare workers, teachers, um, firefighters, all first responders qualify for this program. Um, essentially, it is a rebate rewards program for anyone who purchases a home um, with one of our realtors or lender affiliates. Even if you even if your realtor doesn't um, use the program, I will still offer you an appraisal credit um, if you use me as your lender, it's fine. Um, but um, if you're buying a home, it doesn't matter anywhere in the DMV you know, or North Carolina for that matter, um, or you're refinancing, or even if you're selling, if you're selling a home and you wanna go through a Homes for Heroes realtor, just let me know and they will give you a, re a um, reward at the end of closing when you get to the closing table, you'll get money back. So it's a great program that that I love. And um, that is all I have. If you guys have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. Woo. Well, I'm, this is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question while I sure. uh, give other people opportunity as well. So you mentioned the different programs and I could have missed it, but can these okay. different um things be used together. So like yes. you mentioned like a lot of different ones. Can somebody bring them all together and, and use a bunch of them? Well, I'll tell you, Homes for Heroes can be combined with anything. Okay. So, and also I included some of the down payment assistance programs that I use, but we also accept grants, any grant 
there's there's grants all over. <laughs> there's a lot of organizations that offer grants. So grants through your jobs, um, community grants through Baltimore. I think Baltimore Housing has one. There's a ton of them. Um, and we will accept those grants. As long as they accept us as a lender, um, we can utilize those grants. We have a lot of programs. These are, this is just like the tip of the iceberg with Geneva. We have a we offer a lot of programs. But yes, you can use them in combination. Many of them can be. All right. We got a question in the chat. Sure. How can you help Ashley go from five? Oh, wait a minute. I lost it. Hold on. <laughs> How can you help Ashley go from 580 to what is needed to receive a loan? That was actually my question, too. So I'm glad you asked that. Excellent question. Thank you for that question. Um, that's why it's great. Now, not every lender does this. We do. I can actually, I'm going to help her get to her 580 probably. In, uh, she's actually going to get past 580. We're going to be at 625 in 30 days. Um, and probably if she gets me everything that I need this week, we can probably do it by the end of next week. We can get her to a 625. We have a system called a rapid rescoring system. Um, the, the realtors might be familiar with that, but some lenders, Geneva being one of them, um, what we do is we actually submit a, um, we'll ask you for documentation of a, of a debt that you paid. It'll tell us, we have a system that tells us what you need to pay down in order to get your score up to where we need it to be. And I'll just tell you which, which credit card you need to pay down. So if you got a thousand dollar credit card, I need it paid down to 500. I need you to do that. And then I can get your score up to 625. You do that, show me the receipt. I'm going to submit that and request a rescore and we're going to get it. What? I always get it. I always get my rescore. I've never had a, ever it come back and I didn't get my rescore. Never. Okay, I'm gonna come back to that. <laughs> That's super exciting. Um, also, guys, make sure to check the chat. April dropped in the chat. And she's gonna be talking more about the programs. Kelly, you mentioned about the different grant programs and all of that. So in the chat is the Maryland Mortgage Program um, that was brought up. So April dropped that. So make sure you guys get that. Um, that whole thing about knowing, I think that is so golden. Because as we saw those hands that were raised, right, and I'm sure, again, those who are watching this even after the live, that is the biggest fear. That is one of the biggest reasons why people feel like they can't purchase a home. So knowing that there are programs out there and then you're saying you you could get me an Ashley. <laughs> you can get us right quick. <laughs> I, I have Ashley's all the time. It's all week. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I Love yeah, it. most of my clients are first time home buyers, and most of them need some type of help. So this mm -hmm. is what I do. This is what I enjoy doing more than anything in this world. Um, so yeah, I mean, if anybody don't let it if you guys have if you're thinking of purchasing a home, you, you just it's best to just call me find out I'll have all my information in the chat for you guys. And then we can take a look and see, because you'd be surprised how many people can get a house. It's so many people tell me they don't think they can get a house and then we get them approved. Wow. So, any more questions, comments? I know I'm excited. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> <laughs> any others? All right. So I am going to, do any of our other panelists want to chime in? Because I know all of this kind of crosses over. I know Jennifer and Sydney, we're going to be bringing you guys up next. But any other thoughts before we move on to the next portion? Stacy, go ahead. I was just going to quickly add how important credit is back to insurance is that the, your, your credit also has an impact on how much your insurance rates are. So it can be an impediment to getting the best terms and getting your mortgage down as low as possible in those debt to income ratios if the insurance uh, premiums aren't very high. So it's really important, folks, for everybody to work hard on your credit. It's easier to improve your credit than it is to improve your income sometimes. So work with professionals like, the, you know, Jennifer, Sydney, myself, Kelly so that we can help you uh, get to a better state. You know what, now, so that actually did lead up to another question. So Kelly talked about um, being able to use that life insurance, that the person could have used that life insurance, right? Yes. So my question is, Stacy, let's say you have this cash life insurance. Is that something, let's say I was interested in buying a home. Could I use that to actually pay my debt down to be in a better position? Can you all talk a little long. bit about that? Okay. All day long, all day long. Now, it's not like you get a policy tomorrow and you've got, you know, you know $5,000 in cash value. And depending on the size of the, the plan that you get, like she talked about, if it was a $300,000 whole life or universal policy that you've had for a few years, there's cash in there. 
you can just take it out and use that to pay down your credit card debt or, or, or put down as a down payment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Y'all, I hope y'all getting this game, this free, this free game they drop in. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. And this, again, I can't stress enough. It's all about being empowered, right? With resources, with knowledge so that we can make better informed decisions. So this is awesome. Okay. I'm going to move. And of course, as you think of questions, drop them in the chat. We will be bringing the full panel on shortly, but next we are going to get to the nitty gritty. We're going to talk to our, um, oh, wait a minute. Let me make sure I'm going in the right order. Yes. <laughs> now we're going to talk to our realtors because again, so you've got your self coverage, you got your life insurance going, you got your um your your assets in place. You know what kind of loan you're looking for. You've talked to your lender, you're excited, you got your credit where it needs to be because you've worked with Kelly. So now you are ready to buy that home. I'm going to bring our realtor Sydney Tucker and Jennifer Kristoff Powell, right? <laughs> All right. Let me pin you guys so that we can get the conversation. And of course, um, introduce yourselves. Jennifer, let's start with you with the introduction and then we'll go to Sydney. Okay. Thank you so much. My name is Jennifer Powell Kristoff and I am with Keller Williams. Uh, my team is the Right Fit Realty team. Um, we've collectively been in business for 20 years. I myself have been in business for 12 um, and I have a, a deep passion for real estate and helping people be able to have financial freedom through real estate. Um, so I can't wait to explain, you know, the process and all the details that uh, little tips and tricks we can share with you. Um, and I'm excited to share this time with Sydney too. So go ahead. Hi everyone. My name is Sydney Tucker. I'm a licensed real estate agent in the state of Virginia. I've had my license for a little over a year now. Um, I work with Exit Landmark Realty here in Virginia. Um, and just like Jennifer mentioned, what I love about real estate is uh, I was talking to someone about this recently, that you're not just somebody's real estate agent, you're a friend or helping them with a new step, step in their life because people acquire real estate for all kinds of reasons. Maybe they want to have rental properties, um, have Airbnbs or um, Verbo houses, uh, they might be trying to downsize because kids have moved out or trying to upsize because they're having children or getting married or other big important things happening in their life. So I'm just grateful to be a part of that part of people's journeys. Awesome. Well, welcome ladies. Let's get into the conversation. So the first thing we want to talk about are factors to consider before buying a home. Now we know we've talked about a few things, but I'm going to start with you, Jennifer. Um, so we have our we have our new and we have our experts. So this is going to be an awesome conversation. We're going to get two perspectives. So this is great. So Jennifer, as our expert, I know you have been in this business for a long time and you do different aspects of this, which we'll talk about as the conversation goes on. But what are some things that you say that a person should think about when they're considering buying a home? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, the first thing that anyone should do is reach out to Kelly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, because when you're trying to decide, should I buy a house or not? It's really about, um, you know, gaining the education, the information. So I'm in the information gathering phase. That's what you guys are here doing right now. And what you can do is fill out a no obligation, no cost application with a lender and just have a conversation. I think people are sometimes afraid to talk to a lender too soon. They're talk afraid to talk to a realtor too soon. It's never too soon. I have um, clients that will reach out to me five years in advance and they just want to know what they need to be saving. What do they need to be planning for? And they think, oh, my pre-approval letter is not going to be good that long. Um, either way having the information about what do I need to have for my down payment? What do I need to have for my closing costs? What's the total cash to close I need? And what is that monthly payment going to be really empowers you to be able to say, okay, I know where I am now and where I need to be in order to make this happen. Um, so I think that, you know, doing that is number one, like most important, talk to the lender. We don't even like to go out and tour homes with people until they've done that step, because my last thing I want to do is have you fall in love with something you cannot have. <laughs> um, right. so, so it's really, really, that would be discouraging. Right. And sometimes 
you will qualify actually for more than what you want to spend. <laughs> so that too, when you're like, you know what, um, I qualify for a $700,000 house. However, that means this much monthly, it's like, okay, let's dial that back. Right. So like not just having the number, um, of what you're pre-approved for, but what that means for you and a monthly payment amount and a, and a total cash to close amount is so important to know. Um, because then when we set up the search, we cap it at where you're comfortable monthly, not at what you're qualified for. Um, and so that's really, really important. So we will actually set up searches for people, even if they only want it like once a month, um, or if they want it, you know, ASAP, um, so that you can start to educate yourself on, okay, what can I get for this dollar amount? Um, and so again, we can do that well in advance so that you can start to educate yourself. Um, and one other thing I'll add to that is we like to do a lot of education ourselves too. And so we will do what's like mock offers with our clients that are like not quite ready yet. And so we'll say, Hey, find a house that you really like on your search right now and let us know which one that is. And let's go through the whole process as if we were going to offer on that so that you can kind of see what we would recommend as your suggested offer, um, what we would recommend for the contingencies you include and all of that. And then we'll actually watch that home and see what happened with that and see if they were able, they would have been the winner or not. Um, so that's something we can do to help um, educate through the process of, you know, preparing yourself to know, should I buy now or not? I love that. Awesome. Sydney, what do you have to add to that? Um, so when it comes to factors to consider before buying a home, like um, Jennifer just mentioned about um, knowing how much cash you need to close, how many, like how much is it really going to cost you all in all? Um, one thing I also want to add is that at the time, if you're getting close to the time of buying a home or seriously think about buying a home, that is not the time to do big things that are going to impact your credit, like buying a car, buying a brand new car or something of that caliber that's going to severely impact your credit. Um, because they're not going to be, the bank is not going to be happy to see that you just bought a hundred thousand dollar Ford F-150 right before you're supposed to buy your 7,000, $700,000 house, you know? Um, another thing that I like to tell people is to, it's kind of better to have like a more narrow, to have, when you're getting close to that, I'm really, I'm ready to buy my home. It's kind of better to narrow your selections down to, a couple of where you want to live, most importantly, where is it going to be? Uh, so a couple of cities that you are comfortable living with, because living it within, because a lot of people, the, those where you live affects the whole atmosphere of your life, how far you are from work, how far you are from your children's schools, how far you are from your religious center, how far you are from your family that might live nearby. So you really want to be because some people like to think, oh, well, it would be cheaper for me to live in X, Y, and Z area, but that area is going to affect your commute and the rest of your life, and you're going to be miserable. And you think it's not going to make a big difference, but it will. So have your locations narrowed down to a, a, small ra a smaller radius um, and have your wants, needs, and nice-to-haves kind of in mind already. Um, so you're not just browsing Zillow with like an open mind and all like stars in your eyes, looking at all these beautiful houses that don't even fit your location nor your criteria for a home. Um, and this one is kind of obvious, but you know, always working with a professional realtor um, because a lot of people think that because we're in the information age and so many, so much is available and accessible to us on the internet and that you can just keep going to open houses every weekend and that's what's going to get you a home. Realtors do a lot more than just unlocking doors for you. So always being making sure to work with a professional realtor that is licensed and knows what they're doing. Um, another thing is being prepared to face strong offers, especially in a post-pandemic market. Um, people are just... Their offers are their way, especially during the height of the pandemic, people were waiving contingencies, way, um, offering way above asking, um, just doing everything. There were bidding wars and just everything people could do to acquire the home because the inventory was so low. So just the inventory has gotten better since then, since the pandemic has ended. However, offers continue to be strong where there's very, I find it rare now that 
sellers are willing to accept under asking. I feel like in the past you could accomplish that re reasonably depending on where you were buying, but now I feel like it is asking or above. I'm just saying that out of personal experience as we've had, I've had some clients who thought that they could offer under asking. And then when I called the listing agent to inquire about that, they basically kind of laughed in my face. So um, <laughs> just something to keep in mind as well um, when it comes to this market. And something you just kind of touched on that I love, um, I know we worked with Sydney when we were um, getting, renting a place. And one of the things that I thought was really great, and I recommend this, and y'all both kind of touched on this, but, you know, you might have in your mind, like, okay, this is the amount I want to pay, right? But what I love that Sydney and her team did is they took us all around to places that were within that particular amount we wanted to pay for rent. Because it it's true, it very the whole the place can be completely different than what you think you want, right? So I love that they both talked about like do do that work, like go check places out, look at different places, consider how close this is to you know to one place because it's more than just oh I can afford this amount per month. So I love that y'all both kind of touched on that that piece. Jennifer, I think you were about to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, can I chime in? Um, so I really like what Sydney had to say too, because, um, you know, people a lot of times are looking at the list price as what they think the fair value is of the home. And I just wanted to share because you had said like, you know, you don't be expecting to pay under asking, like absolutely in this market, that's really not, we're not seeing that. Um, and even asking for closing cost credit from a seller, we're not really seeing that either. Probably in the last three years, I haven't seen that be accepted except maybe twice. Um, so just to be like completely transparent and what you should be expecting kind of thing. Um, but for what I wanted to share was um, the price that it is listed for is not always indicative of the fair value. And so I work with... Um, probably 50% sellers, 50% buyers. So we kind of have a pulse on what sellers are doing and what buyers are doing. When I'm going into a listing appointment, I'm sharing with a seller that they have three options. Um, they can list high, sit on the market for 60 plus days and lower their price. They can start right at the right price, get their contract within a couple of weeks, have standard contingencies, home inspection, appraisal, financing. Or they can start a little low, and have this bidding war happen and have people waive contingencies. So based on which choice the seller chose is how it's probably going to play out in one of those ways. So as a buyer, when you go in and you're like, okay, here's the list price, it's important to know what, where, what are the sellers, what was the seller's strategy behind that? Um, and that's where we go in. We actually will provide a suggested offer on each house that someone's interested in. And so we'll take all the factors in consideration. We'll call the listing agent find out what's most important to the seller. Um, and we will also then look at comps and comps are going to be what, sh what shows you and tells you what the fair value is. So you want to find the same thing that we're looking for is what the appraiser is looking for once we're under contract. Uh, we want six properties within the last six months that sold within a mile of the home that have similar square footage, similar beds and baths, similar lot size, similar parking. Um, and then of course there's no apples to apple comparison. So, um, you know, you may have exterior features, um, interior level of finish that are going to be different from house to house. So you go through each comp and you say, okay, should this house be priced above or below this one? Should it be priced above or below this one? And it helps you to find that sweet spot number of where that home should be priced. So for example, when I sold my townhouse, I knew it was worth above 400 but I used the strategy of listing for 375 and I had way too many people come through. We got 10 offers. We got 427. And so some buyers would be like, Oh my gosh, I way overpaid for this house. No, the comps all said 425. So like we knew that to start. Um, and so not, not to be afraid of going over asking if you have the facts um, with the comps that support that value. I totally agree with that. And just to jump on, what you were saying, a lot of people, when it comes to buying a home and they look at the list price and they question why the list price is what it is, sometimes the list price isn't necessarily, like you just mentioned, a number that is accurate to what the home is worth. It's more of how the seller wants that to play out. How do yeah. they want this transaction to play out? 
Um, sometimes it depends, like you mentioned, on the speed of how fast it will play out. Because sometimes they don't have the luxury of letting the house sit on the market for 60 days because they're moving somewhere or something else in their life is happening. So sometimes they just want to get it sold quick. So they're willing to to list it lower than it actually is or right at where it needs to be. Um, so that's another thing for buyers to keep in mind that sometimes the the list price isn't just a number, it's more of a strategy. Yeah. And what sure. y'all say in that? So you you and you mentioned the term bidding war. So <laughs> I know people talk about that. I've had friends who have, have you know are looking to buy a home. And that's very scary. They talk about this bidding war. Bidding war. <laughs> so what advice would you give actually for if you're a buyer? you know, how do you know how far to go with this? Like, do should you, some people I've talked to, they're like, I'm not getting in a bidding war, period. <laughs> so what are your, what's your advice? Like, how do you know what you should do when it comes to this bidding war? And just for clarification, kind of explain again what that term means. Um, do you want to go first? Oh, sure. Um, I was going to say, I really like that question. Um, a bidding war is essentially what it sounds like is where people are, it's kind of like when you go to an auction and people just keep lifting their numbers to try to um, pay more for what some for something that they would like to win. So it's and then at the end, whoever bids the highest and nobody else can go higher than them, they win. So in my in my opinion, I feel like the when it comes to bidding wars and advice on how high it is you want to go it just depends on how badly you want that house because some people depending on what the house is they're like this is my dream house it has every it checks all my boxes it's right in the right location I will do anything to get this home and that's when they're like they feel more motivated to be like I'm going to do whatever it is to get this home whether it's waiving contingencies raising my asking price etc cetera, etc cetera. so because some people think that by bowing out of the bidding war that they're doing that like oh I just saved myself all this money because I bowed out of that bidding war and I was like actually you didn't actually win because they have the house and you don't <laughs> sorry but um <laughs> so it's it's a, it just is about how much you really want to win the thing because mm -hmm. sometimes people just have that sense where they're like well I just bowed out because I just wanted to save money and I'm like but you don't have the house at the end of the day so, um, but when it comes to that, I feel like it also depends on how much, obviously how much you're approved for, if you're trying to go over the amount that you're pre-approved for, um, that's probably not the best idea, but, um, yeah. And cause th there might always be there, most of the time there might be somebody who's more motivated than you and is willing to do even more to get that. So you kind of just have to go back and forth and think is what I'm going to raise or waive or get rid of really worth this house that I want. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, I'm, I'm so interested to see if your feedback is the same, having, having a long time in the game. Do you agree with that assessment? I do. Um, and I think that it's really important for us to know as your realtors, you know, how much you want that house so that we can best advise you. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that we are going to be in constant communication with the listing agent, finding out as much as we can about the other offers so that we can help advise. Um, but also, I think, you know, in the initial buyer consultation with us, talking through each of the different options um, and seeing what are you actually comfortable with when it's a hypothetical before we're talking about the house so that I know are you comfortable waiving a home inspection? Are you comfortable waiving appraisal before we get there? Um, because I can remind you, hey, you told me that you were not comfortable doing that. Are you sure? Right. Um, so I think that that's really important. I think a factor in you know deciding how high you want to go is how long are you going to be there? Um, so one of the things is with appraisals, um, you know, if you are ending up having to pay a little bit over an appraisal, um, that means you're bringing cash out of pocket because the lender's only going to lend on what it appraises for. Um, so how much are you willing to go over the appraisal? Well, it depends. Um, you know, if you are willing to do that, if you're going to be there for 20 years, it might be more worth it than if you're going to be there for two, right? Um, we are seeing property values increase in between, you know, four and 6% per year over the last 20 some years. So we can be sure that like property values are going to continue to increase at about that rate. Um, you are going to be paying your mortgage down as well. Principal, interest, taxes, insurance. Every month, the principal be gets a little bit more that you're paying. So this gap that you're building 
is a significant amount over the course of a few years. Um, but it's really important to know, okay, how much did I overpay? <laughs> um, how much am I willing to go over? So a bidding war doesn't necessarily always mean that you're waiving everything though. So I will just share that I think there are a lot of cons uh, considerations here um, and ways to protect yourself in a bidding war. One is an escalation clause. Um, if you include an escalation clause in your offer that says, I will go this much over the next highest offer capping at a certain point. So let's use 500, for example. Um, I'm offering 500,000. I will go a thousand over the next highest offer capping at 525. So if another offer comes in at 510, I'm going to 511. If somebody offers 526, I'm out. So I always say, think about what you would be like, you know what, it's okay, somebody else can have it for that number. That's where you should put that cap. Um, now it has to appraise for that if you have an appraisal contingency. So in a bidding war, some strategies I'll share are a, um, you, we're not really seeing the home inspection with the option to ask for repairs anymore. Um, we're seeing the home inspection with the option to void only, meaning you go through with the home inspector for three hours or something, learn everything you need to know about the house, everything that's wrong with it. And you say, okay, with this information, I'm comfortable either moving forward or backing out. So that is what we're seeing happen a lot right now. Um, but if there's a bidding war, um, sometimes we see the listing agent say, we're going to review offers as they come in and bids start to go like that. Um, sometimes they're saying we're listing on Thursday, we're reviewing offers on Tuesday. So that gives us some time. Um, and if the seller is willing to allow it, you can say, you can do a pre-offer inspection. So you're doing an inspection before you know if you actually got the house or not yet. So you are paying for that. Um, however, you then go through with the home inspector, learn everything you need to know. Um, the pre-offer inspection is uh, just usually like five major things. So they check for the uh, foundation, um, the major systems for water intrusion, electrical, the roof. They're just not going to go around and check every outlet. Um, so it's, it usually only takes about an hour. So you can use it as a showing block. Um, but then because you have that information, you can say, okay, now I'm going to submit my offer without a home inspection because I've already done one. Um, and so that's a way in a bidding war to strategize, to kind of work around having to just waive your home inspection altogether. Um, so I like that because my, my thing is I've been telling buyers, I don't recommend you do anything you have to do to win. <laughs> no. Um, I don't recommend you waive your home inspection. I don't recommend you waive your appraisal. So here are some strategies you can use, right? Um, and same thing with an appraisal. So, you know, a standard appraisal contingency would say for that $500,000 house that we offered 525 for, um, you know, if the appraisal comes in low, we can, we lower our price to that number or the buyer can back out. Well, um, if you wanted to make your offer a little stronger, you could say in the event, the offer, the appraisal comes in low, I will pay 10,000 over that, but that's the cap. So that is called an appraisal gap. Um, or you can say, I'm waiving my appraisal altogether. And in that case, whatever it comes in at, you're agreeing upfront that you will make up the difference no matter what that difference is. And so that's where that's, that's very risky. Um, and so people are doing that. Um, but I would say I, I would recommend the gap over that for sure. Wow. I, I, I hope y'all are taking notes and definitely our experts make sure you're putting your information in the chat because I know this is just golden information that you don't normally get. So this is really awesome. Now, before I do want to touch on one thing, um, Jennifer, and I, I know when we were planning this, I, I mentioned this to you. Oftentimes what we find is when a person is buying a home, another kind of category of people, and Kelly kind of talked on, uh, spoke on it, um, the person is selling their current home, right? So they're selling their current home and they're purchasing another home. So I know one aspect of the work that you do is also on staging. So for those that might be in the category that you're planning to sell your home and you want to be able to, again, get get top dollar so you can go into your dream next location, right? What are some tips? Why is it important about the staging? 
Okay. <laughs> Good one. Yes. Um, okay. Number one timing. Um, you're probably like, what do I do? Sell first, buy first. What do I do? Then I'll get into staging tips. Um, sell first or buy first. You have a lot of options there. Um, I would say basically you have, so if you were to sell first, you could list your house, um, get it under contract, put a closing date so that you get your proceeds. And then you can do a rent back for a maximum of 60 days so that you can use that amount of time to find another home, go under contract and close on that. Um, typically the lender needs about 30 days. Some lenders, um, can close quicker than that. Um, so especially if they've taken you through underwriting already. So it's important to make sure that you're not just getting like a quick pre-approval or pre-qualification going through the whole process, providing all the information up front so that you don't run into any surprises. Um, if you want to buy first and then sell later, there's also options where, you know, you could do a bridge loan. Um, and Kelly could probably touch on that. Um, and you, so that you could, you know, if you qualify to purchase, then you could go ahead and purchase. And then, um, when you sell recast that to your loan, right, Kelly. So, um, there's a couple of different options there, um, that I think that she can touch on, but, uh, I will talk about staging tips. So number one, it's really important to present your home to the market so that it is showcased, um, so that it is beautifully accepted by a large target market of people. And so in order to do that, what you want to do is, you know, people are going to decide in the first five clicks online, if they're going to go and tour your house or not. So in order to get them to do that, you want to put the most five pictures uh, most five, the five most appealing parts of your home as the first five photos on your listing. That's one of the best things I can recommend. Um, so if you have great outdoor space, if you have a great basement, if you have a great kitchen, um, primary bedroom, any of those things, like it's really important to feature all those things. Don't take me on a tour of your foyer for five photos and then your dining room, um, because you lost me. Right. Um, so, so there's psychology behind how buyers search. That's important as a seller. Um, staging will get you about 7% more for your house. When you, when you professionally stage your home, Wow. Um, the things that I recommend doing are number one, right off the bat, depersonalize declutter and neutralize. So little tips on that are clear off all countertops completely put it underneath cabinets. People will open cabinets, but it doesn't matter. Put it underneath. Um, people will look under beds, put it under beds. I don't care. Um, put it in your closet. As long as I can't see it when I have the professional photos and when people are initially walking through, that's most important. Um, so any countertop, um, if it's your kitchen, if it's your bathroom, if it's your dresser, if it's your end tables, everything clear. The only thing that should be on there is maybe a couple accessories or lamps. Not even, I don't want to see clocks or anything. Um, then on the floor, um, it's best to not have anything other than furniture, rugs, or plants. No trash cans, no toilet brushes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no dog bowls. <laughs> um, now you have to live there. Okay. So like some people do, some people don't. Um, so bring it back out after photos, bring it back out after a tour, but if you can put as much stuff away as, as you possibly can so that people are looking, what you want to accomplish is for people to see the bones of the house. Um, so it's so important that there's not stuff blocking their way when they're walking, um, that they're not distracted by anything. And so that will also bring me to, um, family photos, college degrees, uh, sports memorabilia. Anything that's on the wall that says, this is who I am and this is what I like may not be who they are and what they like. Mm. So we want them to see themselves in the home. We want mirrors when they first walk in. We want things that say home around. Um, we want to create a feeling. We want the smells to be nice. We want, you know, nice, light, bright, like let there be light. Um <laughs> You know, so there are, you may have these beautiful curtains that your grandmother made you that are plaid and dark and heavy, and they are great because you get to sleep in. Um, but we want the light when we're showing your home. 
Um, so if I could share my screen real quick, I do want to show you guys a couple of um, before and after pictures. Absolutely. Okay. Let's see if this works. Can you see my screen? No. Well, this might have to be something for later. Oh, uh, let's, let me see. Let me hit this. Now try it. Okay. Does it work? Oh, wait, it's in. Here we go. It's going to work for me. <laughs> I might have to quit and reopen. So I'm going to let Sydney and I'm going to come back to the meeting and share it with you guys. Okay. <laughs> So Sydney, of course, and I know, again, you deal with the selling as well. So were there any additional tips that you wanted to bring regarding if you're the person who is selling the home um, and you're looking to maybe sell and then buy your next place? Any additional tips that you want to add? Hmm. Tips about selling and um, additional tips when it comes to selling or listing your home. Probably, like she mentioned, like uh, Jennifer mentioned, depersonalizing your house is kind of important because um, it's difficult for people to see themselves. Like she says, you don't want to obstruct the bones of the house because that's what the person who buys is going to get at the end of the day anyway. When they are handed the keys, they're only going to have the bones of your house. They're not going to have anything else in there that you would have left. So it's important to just showcase what the home could be. Awesome. And it looks like we've got sharing. <laughs> yes, it's working. Yes. Okay. Can you guys see my screen here? Yes. Okay. Um, Sydney, I didn't want to cut you off. Were you, uh, did you wrap no, up? Fine. No, I'm, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. So here is an example of a lot of homes that I'll walk into. They'll have like heavy pieces of furniture um, and they'll have some stuff covering up the windows. Um, so I will come in, I own about 10 houses worth of staging furniture. Um, and I will come in and totally like have the movers move stuff to storage or move stuff to basement, move things around so that, um, the first floor, um, you know, it's most important as people are making their, their, um, you know, kind of judgment or assessment of your home. And so we replaced that living room with this setup and it's much more open and bright, um, and more neutral, not as heavy, dark um, for, um, you know, rugs and patterns and things like that. Wait, so that's the same things, room? This is the same room. What? <laughs> you see those doors back there? Those are the same doors right here. Oh um, my goodness. Wow. It yeah. doesn't look like the same. Room. <laughs> <laughs> Looks well, really you. good. Thank you. Um, and so here's an example too, of like a kitchen table and a kind of a smaller space that like it needed something that was a little lighter. Um, and so we open that up with just a glass table. So if you have a smaller space, glass will really help. Mm. Um, and again, taking down curtains. Um, here's another example of kind of, you know, a beautiful, beautiful antique furniture and, um, you know, rugs. And so you don't want to offend anyone when you're going through their home, because this is beautiful furniture that they have, and it means a lot to them. Um, but my job is really to appeal to the masses. And so I'm like, you know what, it's going to help you to actually go ahead and pack this stuff up. You can take it with you um, and allow us to go neutral. Wow. Big difference. And people, again, people are willing to pay more for something like this. Um, here's an example of kind of that patterned uh, curtain I was talking about. Um, and you know, some wallpaper and things will, people will a lot of times ask me, they're like, should I allow the buyer to do their own touches on the home? And rather than me do it, because you know, they're just going to come in here and rip everything out anyways. No, you are going to pay more for that later because not as many people are going to show up. There's going to be people saying as they go through, they're going to be counting all the things they have to pay for. Um, when you create a space that they don't have to do anything with, you get top dollar. So here's the before and here's the after. Wow. <laughs> um, and so I try to go minimal on patterns. Like you see these um, patterned uh, curtains here. You know, I just took the curtains down, but like I will like 
you know, one set of patterns per room, really. You don't want to do too much pattern because it distracts the eye. Um, here's another example of a kitchen with that dining table that just helps open it up. Um, and another living room setup. Okay, so I'm gonna go to, so we also recommend renovations. Um, and so I do have a background in interior design and I can tell people, you know, here are some upgrades that will get you the highest return for your home. Um, so the, the things that I'll recommend most are kitchens, bathrooms, paint, and floors by far. Mm -hmm. Um, so you may see a kitchen that looks like this and it's like, um, you know, the kitchen is going to sell the home. This is a huge project. Someone might come through here and say, you know, this is way too big of a project for me. Um, all we did was replace cabinets, take this soffit out of the top, put in, um, granite countertops. That's it. They, we kept the stainless steel appliances and it looks like this. Wow. Um, these people got a hundred thousand more than they would have if they didn't do this renovation. So they put in maybe 25 into this kitchen and they got a hundred thousand more. Um, and I do have contractors that will allow people to pay at closing. So if you have a major project you want to do, um, and you don't have the funds for it up front, but you had the funds for it when you go to settlement, um, that's an option that we can provide. Wow. So same thing in here. We actually just painted these cabinets. Um, so I'm not going to rec recommend doing, you know, a full cabinet, you know, replacement unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, so if we can paint cabinets, we'll definitely do that. And that's what we did here. Mm -hmm. But see how much lighter that is. Wow. And so even if you're like, you know what, the buyer is going to rip this out. It's going to appeal to so many more people. It's going to get you that higher dollar amount. Um, it is worth doing some of these minor touches um, to get yourself in a better position, um, especially, and you can even take out home equity lines to pay for this, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of times I'll recommend painting cabinets rather than replacing them. So like we did that in this bathroom right here. Um, and these mirrors say, hi, I'm from 1980. <laughs> yeah, <they do. laughs> so you could just replace the mirror and the lighting and paint this cabinet and have a totally new bathroom. Wow. Wow. Same thing here. We did replace this vanity and we painted, but what a difference. Um, so these are some recommendations I can make not breaking the bank at all. Like this one, see these cabinets, all we did was paint them. It makes a huge difference. Um, so these are things I can recommend, um, you know, again, not to break the bank, but to help get top dollar for your home. Um, and we do offer complimentary home staging as a part of our services when we work with sellers. Um, so we own, like I said, about 10 houses worth of furniture. Um, if you took your family photos down and you need neutral art to put up and you don't want to go buy that, we bring that. Um, if you need lighting, we'll bring that. Uh, if you need different rugs, same thing, or if it's a completely vacant home, we can furnish the whole thing and make it look like a model home. Wow. Nice. Yes. It's a great yes. service. Yes, 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 thank yes. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you both. I know, as I mentioned, we'll be bringing everybody back at a certain point, but that was excellent. Um, we are going to, does anyone have any questions before we go to our final um, speaker? Any questions for our, for these two? Okay, it says, what assistance is available for those who don't have the health or wealth to go to war <laughs> over a house? That's a great question. Cause I, th you're right. The bidding war thing, I know so many people who are like, I can't do it. So what, what is assistance available for those who don't have the health or wealth to go to war over a house? I'll just chime in on the financial side. Um, whether you, we all have to live somewhere. So you're going to be at war either way, whether it's with trying to, with a seller or with a landlord, trying to find living that's affordable. So sometimes it's a matter of choosing which battles you want, because once you purchase a home, it's more permanent. It's not, 
the thing that you're going to have to deal with every year with your rent going up or going up or going up or and then having to move again and again because there's a cost to that that also takes from our health and from our wealth. Yeah. And is this question from a seller standpoint or buyer? Buyer, I think. It is a buyer. Yeah. Sounds like buyer. No, no, okay. Well I just wanted to make sure because, you know, you have some sellers who don't want to deal with it either. They just want to, you know, get rid of the house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, from the buyer. Yeah. And I, I'm with you there. That that part can be so frustrating. So I would say um, to chime in on that, you know, um, there's going to be properties that are available online that are coming soon or active. Um, our job as realtors, in addition, are to find potentially off-market properties for you. So if you're not in a position to go into a competitive market, competitive bidding war, um, one recommendation would be to have an agent that will go around and find properties for you that are not currently active on the market. Um, one way that our team does that is we throw block parties in neighborhoods and we will bring our donut truck and we will have lemonade and coffee and we'll have a block party and we'll have the neighbors meet each other and we'll find out if anybody's planning on moving. So if we have a buyer looking in that neighborhood, we'll throw a block party in the neighborhood and we'll try to find out, you know, anybody who's looking to move. That's a just very organic way to bring community together because that's what we're really about. And then also have some intel for you. Um, in addition, we will go and knock on doors and say, hey, you know, can you help us out? Um, you know, we have someone who's willing to pay what it would be if they went to full market. Um, but we just, you know, we're losing out right and left. Would you allow us to come and tour and have an opportunity to offer before you go to market? Um, we do have a lot of good success with that too. Um, and then what about for, uh, for sale by owners? I mean, they don't want to pay for the listing agent, but they'll pay the buyer. I mean, yeah. if they want to sell that house, you know, yeah. So that's an option too. You know, looking at for sale by owner is definitely a good option. Um, so I think, you know, there's that. There's also setting your search less. So if you are like, hey, I'm willing and able to pay up to 600,000, maybe set your search at 550 um, so that you can actually go into a bidding war because you're comfortable going up to that. Um, you know, just don't put yourself in like, a position where every single thing is you're at top dollar already at list. Um, so that would be a strategy to think about too. I love that. I love that. So we're going to come back to more questions. I want to get to our final presenter. Thank you, Sydney, Jennifer. Love that. We are getting armed and ready <laughs> <laughs> to either buy or sell our home. So that is awesome. So next we are going to move to our final speaker. And I am going to bring Miss April up to the to the front here. Let me remove everyone else's pen really quick and bring, where did April go? There she is. Okay. So April is going to be talking to us about housing, um, housing programs. And so of course, April has tremendous background experience in the housing program market, both nonprofit organizations and all of that. So April, I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself and let's talk about the housing programs. Hi, uh, my name is April Martin. I um, have about 15 years of housing experience, mostly rental, um, but I work for the Maryland Department of Housing and I work very closely with the um, Virginia Department of Housing. Um, and mine is not going to be very long. I just actually the Mor Maryland Mortgage Program that I provided the link for Stacy um, already mentioned that. So I just threw that paper to the side. Um, <laughs> but but um, that link does give you a lot of information, eligibility criteria and whatnot. Um, the two main programs I wanted to talk about with Fairfax County involved the ADU program. Um, one is the first, first time home buyers program, but it's through the ADU program. Um, it's the eligibility criteria is not um, extensive. Um, you have to make a minimum of 25,000, uh, 620 credit score, 2% uh, down plus closing costs and whatnot. Um, there's um, special, um, you know, accommodations for people 55 and older for seniors. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is that. And that's mainly keeping people um, within that um, 
under 70% AMI, um, area median income. If you make more than that, there's an alternative program um, that's called the Workforce Development um, Unit Home Buyer Program that works the, kind of the same way, but allows for more income, right? So if you're between, I think it's 70 and uh, above 70, actually, any, yeah, above 70, um, but you have to fall below 120%. Um, there's eligibility eligibility criteria. I'm going to provide both links in the chat. Um, same cr criteria as far as the two percent down and your your um your credit score being six twenty. Um, also, th this has to be your primary residence. This is not something you can rent out um, or make money off of. Um, and any refinancing, you have to notify Fairfax County about. There's also a, a certain period of time um, that you have to uh, have the property in your possession before selling. And there's um, some criteria involved uh, penalty wise if you do sell before that time period. There's also um, special properties that they do offer and it's well below, well, well, well below market. <laughs> um, so if income is, a, is a, if, if the amount and, and the bidding wars and all that stuff scares you because your income is between 70 and 120 or even under 70, um, percent, you know, you can make as low as $25,000 a year to qualify for some of these programs and they can be combined with other programs as well. Um, so yeah, it's just something to, uh, to consider. I, I work more on the, um, homeless services side, um, and trying to provide victims of human trafficking or homeless clients and, and homeless veterans, um, offering them some lifeline because a lot of times they don't think they can, you know, if you're getting um, even a, a housing choice voucher, which was formerly known as Section 8, there's a home buying piece to that. Um, they just don't promote it. And so you don't hear about it unless I tell you right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll provide those links for both of those programs. I already provided the Maryland Mortgage Program, which I'm a huge fan of. And if you are a state employee of Maryland, there's additional um, benefits, um, to that. So, you know, just something to, to consider. And, you know, April, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you in this conversation, ha knowing you as long as I have and how I kind of asked this to Stacy in the beginning, but why is this so important when it comes to a person's value? You know, you've been doing this work for a long time, different aspects. Why is having your own home, whether that's renting or buying, why is that so important um, to a person, their value, their their self-worth and esteem and all that? Can you talk about that? Because I know you're so passionate about this topic. Yes. Um, so our motto in the homeless services world is people always do better in housing. Mm -hmm. um, if they have a roof over their head, they can accomplish a whole lot more our job or my job was to provide services that wrapped around people like a security blanket. But our first job before we did anything else um, was to put a roof over their head. You know, um, a lot of times we take for granted just having a roof over our head. Um, my parents actually moved out of the country when I was uh, 19 and my daughter, um, my firstborn had just passed away. Um, so I lived in my car for three months. So the clients that I serve, I feel, um, you know, what it's like. And I will say from experience, it's just nothing like having a roof over your head to make you enable you to do better. You can't do better when you're, when you have no home. It's yeah. like your, your base. Um, all the clients that I served through rental housing and luxury communities for over 15 years, you know, people would complain about their blinds being bent. Um, but my first day on the job working with Fairfax County, um, the lady cried in the kitchen because it was there. Wow. <laughs> because wow. she had lived in a basement for eight years wow. and she hadn't cooked her children a meal in eight years. So I think that for me, housing means everything. Mm. Wow. wow. Thank you so much, April, for sharing. You know, I, I think you're awesome. I've known you. Like I said, you're so passionate about this. And we just want, again, I can't stress enough how much we want women 
and girls to feel empowered, to have resources, to have education. And as April said, to have a home <laughs> and whichever, yes. maybe it's stair steps, right? Like you said, maybe it's just finding the right program to get you in a home. And then you can utilize some of these other services that our realtors talked about and our lenders, right? But we here at My Natural Me, which April is on our board as well, um, we are all about making sure people have what they need to succeed. So thank you again, April, for sharing that information. <laughs> now I'm going to just bring everyone. Yes, we got the hearts and the love. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to just bring everyone back in just for any final um Questions, thoughts for our panel. Let's see, what am I missing? Okay. So anyone have any thoughts, questions that they want to ask or share with our panel? I'll share something. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so just what April was just talking about, um, I think that something to think about and feeling empowered about this whole conversation tonight is, you know, thinking about maybe it isn't even your dream home that you're first purchasing. I know mine wasn't. Um, <laughs> it was a tiny little townhouse, um, but it got me that doing that one investment allowed me to do so much more. So I used it as like a stair step. Um, and it was really cool to be able to watch, to see what that appreciated for and what that allowed me to buy next. And then what that allowed me to buy after that, you know, so just using home ownership as a tool uh, is a really cool thing to be able to do. Um, and to be in this position to be thinking about it right now means that you're about to have that come to fruition, which is really exciting. Awesome. We do have a question. Someone said, are services available to New Jersey area? So I have um, a group of people in my team who uh, vet and make sure that anyone that we would recommend in another city um, would be a really, really great connection for them. So we have people in pretty much every city in the U.S. that we can recommend. Amazing. And I'll put my information in the contact because if there's any um, programs, I'm a master researcher. I I can find anything. I can't sing, but I can find anything. <laughs> um, but we do have um, partners in the immediate area. Um, and I still have a lot of friends at the Department of Housing. So if there are any programs that New Jersey provides, I can at least help direct you in that 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 direction. So I'll put my info in the chat. Awesome. And like Jennifer, I also am part of a nationwide group of um, of stellar, high-performing uh, vetted agents who can help you wherever you are. And that includes making sure that once you obtain those assets, like your home or whether it's an apartment, that that's that's it's still housing, to make sure that you have the right protection for it, so it doesn't become the thing that sucks wealth out of us but adds to our wealth. I love it. Sydney, go ahead. Um, and I just wanted to add that I like, I really enjoy being the liaison between Gen Z and the fear of home buying. Um, <laughs> because, you know, with Gen Z, a lot of the times having ho home ownership is something that seems very unattainable, like an unrealistic dream, because unfortunately, renting kind of has this cycle to it where the rent goes up and then you can't save for a home because you're trying to put all that money back into rent and you're kind of just subject to wherever you live, their rents going up. And if you don't want to move or if you have nowhere to go or you're not ready to buy a house, you're just kind of subject to continuing to pay that. So the cycle just keeps to keeps like incurring on itself. Um, but I just enjoy being that person who gets to explain to people of my generation about home buying and um, like demystifying it and, you know, um, eliminating some of those myths for people um, because a home can do a lot that a rental can't. Um, it can help you build equity. And like Jennifer mentioned, um, someone once told me your first home is not your dream home or something like that. It's a step to your, or your first home is a precursor to your dream home or something like that, or it's a step towards your dream home. So, um, so first time home buying can be scary, but I like being able to, because, you know, a lot of people in my generation like to say like, oh, I should have been buying properties when I was nine instead of being in first grade, you know, but <laughs> um, because as we all know, 
home prices have increased and everything, but it's also getting harder to, you can't save as fast as you can, you can't, I'm going to say this wrong, I'm going to butcher it, but um, you can't save as fast as the prices are rising. That was what I was trying to say. But so like, and I wanted to emphasize what Kelly said, if you are interested or thinking about home buying, don't hesitate just you know you'll never you might not know how much you qualify for so that's all I wanted to add. and that's what I wanted to kind of add um it's it, it it seems intimidating at first um that's why it's important just to talk to a professional whether it's your realtor or myself um because we're the ones that can actually look at the whole picture for you and make a recommendation for you and enlighten you and educate you on this process and um you don't know until you speak with us so don't don't be fearful of it 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 can really happen for you and as you see there are lots of resources out there and that's what we're here for, to help get you approved to purchase a home and create that general wealth for yourself and your family. I love it. I love it. I'm getting that. And I, I will say that out of the 90 families that we housed in 90 days, they were all homeless and, and or victims of human trafficking. Mm. 10 ended up being home buyers. Wow. Wow. And that's, that's a fantastic. huge number. Awesome. 10%. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. And that was all thanks to the realtors. They were able to talk to them and make them feel like this isn't just like something that I'm, you know, I, I dream of, you know, I'm in mean, reality. Um, and I will say too, I'm sure we all have a lot of additional strategies we can share. So please feel free to reach out to us. Um, one of the things I wanted to share was uh, we didn't talk too much about down payment, but um, you know, sometimes people have a little bit of a myth about, I have to put 20% down to avoid uh, private mortgage insurance. You know, should I put 3%? Should I put 5%? Should I put 10, 20? Um, and one little uh, thing that I've recently done was there was a house that needed a lot of renovation. Um, and what we did was we put 5% down on it, did the renovations, and then had the lender um, or the appraiser come back out and reassess the value after the work had been done. And it showed that it has actually was 20% from the, um, you know, the loan to value. So they were able to drop their private mortgage insurance in three months. Um, so thinking about where you use your money, do you use it all for the down payment or do you use it some for, um, you know, renovations or things, if you're going to need to do that, there's ways to kind of you know, tailor things specific to what each person that's listening to this is, is wanting to do. So do know that, you know, we can talk about your specific needs, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one with any of us here. Um, so please do feel free to reach out to us. Yeah. I love and there it. are renovation yeah. loans as well. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so, and that not just conventional, but, you know, they work the same way um, as um, the regular FHA loans, uh, three and a half percent down and the new value is based on, uh, based on where it's a, appraised at and um, that's where your loan would be and it includes the renovations so it's uh that can be uh, another great uh pathway to home ownership to a fixer-upper that you turn into um your dream home yeah. awesome. through renovations stacy any final thoughts words as we close out i can't be more excited to be on this call with the people i see in the audience who i know are very interested in some of the things we're talking about. Um, the, the, the topics covered were very, very, very specific uh, on the buying side, on the mortgage side. Some of the things won't apply to each person on the call, but the thing that does apply to all of us is that we're trying to create a legacy and the tools and the, the, the thoughts that were shared here tonight are gonna help each and every one of you do it. Whether you buy a home or not, what you've learned tonight has helped enlighten you and heighten your awareness of how your coins work and how you can make them work for you in so many ways. And so if you take nothing else away from here, think about a new relationship, a new way you think about your money and a new way you think about your legacy and what you're going to leave to those who, who come behind you. And so I'm honored and thankful to have been on the call with these lovely, 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 smart, you know, ladies who are just as passionate about educating people as I am. And, and I'm honored to work with you guys and hope to connect some more. I love it. Well, awesome. thank you all. Uh, once you. again, the, you will have all of their information. Of course, if you registered for this particular uh, virtual side, you will get the, an email with their contact information as well as the video of this. So you will have it. Um, those who are watching this through YouTube or some other channel, you will see their information in the show notes. 
Again, this organization, my organization, My Natural Me, is a nonprofit organization. So definitely check out our website if you want to learn more about our workshops and education and training that's out there. Um, if you want to offer workshops and training, um, again, I appreciate all these women, these experts in their field, um, donating their time for something like this because we are a nonprofit organization. Um, but they top dollar, y'all. So don't, <laughs> so you might want to go through us to get to them. But, but seriously, um, again, we appreciate all the support. And um, yeah, we will close out from there and you will get their information. And thanks for joining us this afternoon for this workshop. Thank you. Can some of you ladies put your IG handles in the chat? I was trying to connect with the yes. Oh you guys. Yes, I will. Or find me and follow me. I'm Stacy Insures me. I guess I could have put that on there. IG. I can't see that. <laughs> And I'll make sure to send that out too. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Or tag them in your post or something like that. And then I'll, I'll, I'll... yes. I was looking all day for Lita because normally Lita has it in her story. And I'm just like, where's her story so I can share? 